This is uh, track B of Content Delivery Summit. <clears throat> We're going to talk about understanding the difference between quality of service and quality of experience in video delivery. Uh, my name is Luke Carrier from Whitby. I'm technology evangelist. Uh, Whitby is a quality of experience company. Um, and I have some experience with building uh, OTT applications um, and launching them uh, prior to that, doing subscription management for uh, publications, uh, digital publications online. So uh, when building these OTT applications, I noticed that there was usually an issue when content provider companies would try to go direct to consumer and they, um, for the first time, found themselves dealing with customers directly, which they had previously relied on some intermediary cable operators to manage the customers and the subscriptions uh, and uh, any customer support issues. And when <clears throat> they went direct to consumer, uh, they were all of a sudden confronted with needing to ensure quality because they had that instant feedback loop of, of hearing back from their customers when there were issues. So um, I wanted to speak a little bit about the difference between quality of service and quality of experience. Um, a little bit of background about Whitby. Uh, founded in the year 2000, it's an 18-year-old company, publicly traded on the French Stock Exchange. Uh, we have offices in New York, um, Denver, Montreal, uh, opening in San Jose uh, later this year, and around, around the world as well in EMEA. Um, our customers are some of, uh, they, they span the content providers, uh, telcos, uh, multi-service operators, uh, mobile operators, around the world. And they rely on us for quality of experience monitoring. So what is quality of experience uh, at its core, at its essence? Uh, it's essentially monitoring the, uh, the output, the throughput of, of what your service or your product is delivering. So whether it's a SaaS application or a mobile application or a, a digital product or a digital service, it's using that from the end user's perspective and um, monitoring the quality from that perspective. So in this case, probably the most famous uh, example of quality of experience that everyone can relate to is the Verizon commercial a few years ago where uh, they went around the country asking, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? He was in the, in the uh, shoes of a consumer looking at the um, quality of the service from that perspective. And whether it's digital voice or video over the top, um, taking that perspective is, is really important. And the new can you hear me now, which is less common with issues of that, with that these days, is can you watch it now? You know, your video's buffering, um, it's uh, hung up in certain places, uh, it's taking uh, longer than you expected to show your friends some video or to load a GIF or something. So um, in the startup world, there's the saying, eat your own dog food, meaning you consume the product that you create so that you have that feedback loop and see the product from the customer's perspective. Um, some other companies have changed that to drink your own champagne. In this case, I would say, you know, watch your own OTT uh, service or um, eat your own popcorn as this uh, robot is doing here as he watches TV. So can I just get a little survey of the audience? How many are uh, involved in an OTT uh, video product, building one, launching one, servicing one? Um, okay, it looks like about half the audience. And how many are more concerned only on the CDN at, uh, vertical of the delivery chain? Looks like about a third of the audience, okay. Great, so um, you probably, uh, know this already, but the traditional broadcast um, delivery chain looked a little bit something like this. It was managed from the core, the, the network was intelligent, and it was pushing video actively out towards the edge, and the devices weren't so smart, set-top boxes, um, uh, TVs in the case of over-the-air broadcast. And a lot of the delivery chain was managed you know, internally. They had control of it, so uh, they were able to manage their own subscriptions, right, and do billing and uh, do uh, turning on and off the service. They distributed it through networks and controlled the last mile and even the set-top box, the device that you were consuming through. So naturally, when you want to monitor the quality for that, the easiest thing to do is make sure that each 
step along the delivery chain is operating at five nines uptime. And you can pretty much assume that if everything is 99.999% working, then your service is gonna be working for the end viewer and it's, he's gonna have an okay experience. Now when the industry shifted, uh, is shifting to OTT, and it's more and more of a, a trend, you're seeing it in the mergers and acquisitions that are happening, um, content companies uh, uh, buying tech stacks in order to distribute their own content, uh, even um, AT&T and Time Warner, Disney buying BAM tech, um, recently uh, IMG, um, um, but uh, New Lion, or uh, not IMG, but I'm sorry, I'm mis misremembering my, my companies, but there's been a lot of consolidation in the space, and what this all is is an effort to deliver OTT video applications. So with that, with this new architecture, there is no video being pushed from the core to the edge, right? Everything is transaction-based, so everything starts now, rather than the left side of the core being pushed out, it starts with the viewer, the end user, uh, initiating some action on an application, uh, making a request through their device, through uh, the last mile connection, through different networks and CDNs, um, even through different authentication and user rights management platforms. Think of buying something on your Apple TV and wanting to consume it on your iPhone. Uh, so then it has to come back again through this unmanaged uh, delivery chain of vendors and be a good viewing experience for the viewer. So what happened is a lot of the companies that were doing quality of service and ensuring monitoring of the former architecture just said, well, let's take that thinking and apply it to this. So let's just make sure that every piece is working properly and we'll measure it and you know, take its temperature along the way. And if it's all working, then probably the viewers have a good experience. But actually, that's not true. That's kind of a fallacy. And I'll share some, um, some theory behind that in a minute. Um, because in unmanaged networks, you probably uh, all know, there can be some failure in the network and the viewing experience can be just fine. Or there also, the network can be working perfectly and there can be a bad viewing experience. So there's actually um, not that, that direct correlation and what's required is to take uh, the viewpoint of the end viewer and monitor from that point through the service and back again. Um, so to take this linear left, left to right, um, delivery chain, it would actually be a mirror of that. So you would start with the viewer, go to the core, and then back to the viewer. And there's actually a precedent for this in nature. So uh, with echolocation uh, and sonar, um, you know, humans open our eyes and light is pushed at us and we, we perceive the environment around us. But for bats and dolphins observing butterflies and fish, they have to send out a signal first, and then they read the response to that signal, and uh, that's how they're able to understand their environment. That's their experience of their environment. So it's the same with devices and uh, viewers here. Our robotic viewer is acting as an end user, a referential end user, making a request, uh, and then perceiving and reading and monitoring and uh, measuring uh, the, uh, the response uh, that he gets and the, the quality of the video that he's watching through the entire network. And um, what some of the solutions out there, you know, to make an extended metaphor, what, what it would be comparable to is trying to deduce the activity of the bat or the dolphin, the user, by knowing where the butterflies and the fish are, right? If we somehow, you know, we have software agents on the devices and somehow if we track all the fish and see them all moving one way, we try to deduce what that means for, for the user and how we can optimize our, our uh, service in order to um, help that user. But actually, this is not the right approach. And um, I think you might remember from like Statistics 101, correlation is not causation, it's really difficult to just take all that data from uh, edge devices and to try to deduce from that uh, what, the, uh, what the experience of the viewer was. So in this case, ice cream sales correlates with shark attacks, 
And you might think it's a leading indicator that if you buy ice cream, you're more likely to be attacked by a shark. One is causing the other. And no matter how much data, more data you collect, uh, you know, about ice cream sales and the specific amount of ice cream that was sold or uh, the time of, of the day that it was sold, or how much about shark attacks and where they were located, no amount of more data or no amount of better data is going to make that correlation more legitimate. Uh, what we need to do is step back and ask the right question, why are both of these things happening? Um, and then we see that they both happen in summer and it's actually because of the time that they're happening at the same time. Another sort of lesson of asking the right question is, a story of a statistician who was approached by the military and given data of this aggregated amount of uh, airplanes that had returned from battle with bullet holes in the wings. And they asked the statistician to decide where to armor up the planes, where to um, you know, make it more safe and, and more efficient to uh, make sure more planes returned. And he looked at this data and he didn't ask for you know, more specific data about the trajectory of the bullet holes or more, um, uh, quality data, uh, he actually asked a different question, which is where is the missing data? Um, you'll notice there's empty spots near the engines over the wings, there's empty spots in the, in the front of the plane. And he understood the core of the question, it wasn't really to put more armor where the most uh, uh, errors or, or uh, where the most damage was, but to ask why haven't some planes returned? And if you had a referential plane, so this, these bullet holes were taken from many planes that, that came back, but the, there's a bias in the data set because it was the only ones, only the ones that came back which were included in that data set. So if you had a referential plane that was going out and coming back, going out and coming out back, and you were watching it uh, consistently, then you would notice that the ones that were shot in the engine didn't return. So. Um, so this is kind of a parallel of what's happening in the, in the QoS. When you're taking a QoS approach to an OTT world, uh, you might miss some data. You're only seeing the data of the, um, uh, of the network, uh, which might not correlate to the data of the, the, the viewer. You might only see uh, what's happening on the devices without really seeing the user's experience. So, what we're really saying is to ask for the signal that you want, ask for the answer to the question that you're asking, rather than uh, listen to a lot of noise and try to deduce the answer. So, for example, in this context of being here in this auditorium, I can ask uh, my friend at the back, can you hear me okay? Uh, is, is everything good back there? And get a signal, thumbs up, you're, you're good. And I know now that it's good, I have a clear signal, versus trying to deduce from feedback and uh, maybe from the attention that people are paying, whether or not you can hear me and, and try to correlate all of that to decide that there's an issue uh, when there's enough um, uh, data in one area. So what we see, that's signal, yes or no, versus noise. And when they are combined in the real world, uh, you can tell that there's a, a signal there um, in the bottom graph. But to the left of the signal, uh, where on this, uh, this line that's going gradually up and to the right, at what point do you know that there's a new signal? At what point do you decide, okay, um, I, I need to take action on this, on this signal, I need to fix my audio. Uh, this could also be compared to um, you know, channel change time, where there's all of a sudden a drastic in increase in channel change time. You would rather know that right away, that there's been an increase so you can fix it, rather than uh, wait for an aggregate amount of data, aggregate amount of users to decide that there's an issue. Or it could be uh, you know, buffering time on a mobile video device where you know, it's rush hour and people are all in the subway and you get some feedback that a lot of, there's a lot of buffering happening. When it has nothing to do with your service, it's the nature of uh, mobile networks maybe not uh, being optimized for the subway at rush hour. Too much, um, there's too much traffic and uh, it's not handling it well. So you want to differentiate, is my service working, yes or no, from uh, trying to correlate and deduce and estimate whether, whether it is working. Um, and there's other questions too it can answer. Is my service working? Uh, is 
the video being displayed the right, the right video, the right asset, and what is the quality uh, of the video. So all of this, and in fact all of Whitby, um, is based on this DIKW pyramid, this, um, this thinking that from data uh, you can uh, derive information, knowledge, and make wise decisions. Um, but what, what the main point I'm trying to make is that you can't just take the data that's convenient for you, that's accessible to you, and try to correlate your way to the best decision. Uh, you really need to make sure you're asking the right questions. And um, when you have that referential user using the service, viewing the quality that's coming through the entire delivery chain, this is operating at the information level. And it's really difficult to get from that data level to that information level, like I said, just through uh, correlation. Rather, it has to be from asking the right question. And only after getting the answer to the right question can you then uh, use that knowledge to make good decisions on improving your uh, service. So uh, that's the main point that I wanted to make. It's really more theoretical than uh, technical, but it's, I think, uh, drives home the difference in philosophy between measuring just a quality of service and the fact that the network is working, uh, that various pieces of the delivery chain is working, versus making sure that viewers having a great experience and measuring uh, from that perspective. So um, my name is Luke. Again, my company is Whitby, Quality of Experience Monitoring, uh, and we um, are happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Yes, in the back. So uh, you talked about voltage through SQLE areas. Um, what are the most important two KPIs for quality experience? Yeah, great question. So I think um, um, there, there's different KPIs that different um, customers want to measure, you know, depending if they're a cable operator or a mobile network or a content provider, they care about different things. So um, the specific KPIs can be, there can be some room there, but generally there's some large themes, which is, uh, you know, is the service available? Is, if, if you turn it on, is it working or not? And half of you that raised your hand that said you were involved in an OTT application, I'd be interested to know if you're 100% confident that if I, went on my mobile device through the Wi-Fi at the Hilton, if it would work for me you know, right now or if there would be extreme buffering. Do you really you know, know that um, or are you just hoping that it's working because you pieced it together and architected it correctly and, um, and everything in the network looks like it's operating fine? So just a simple question, is it working or not? You know, having a, whether you do it manually, which I encourage you to do, you know, drink your own champagne, um, or whether you automate that process so that it's scalable and so that it's being tested repeatedly um, uh, again and again, programmatically, automatically, uh, I would say as, look for availability. Also, um, performance, so over time, uh, you want to make sure the quality of the video is there as measured by a MOS score, a mean opinion score, and um, there are algorithms that you know, emulate the human uh, experience, you know, through some machine learning or artificial intelligence to understand, for example, in a hockey game, that the puck is more important uh, visually than the ice, and that the resolution and the and the um, viewing experience of that puck is more important. So they're scoring the video according to how a human would uh, perceive it, and giving you that performance measurement of the quality of the video. Um, and then the last thing is. Uh, assets, uh, vi video on demand asset checking. So making sure that the video delivered is the right one, that all the content in your library is, um, when it's being played, it's the correct uh, asset. So those are three main um, availability, performance, and um, integrity. Sure. So, um, what 
I guess there's two approaches to doing it. The quality of service would say, well, we need a sample, and then if we test that sample, we can sort of deduce what the rest of everyone else is um, is, is doing. Um, I would I would say our approach is different. It's more of taking a referential user and um, repeating the different actions that a user would take, playing the video, pausing it, uh, restarting it, and measuring all of those things uh, along the way. So um, I don't know that there's an amount of of uh, QoS data collection that would do that. You know, in the example of Google Maps or, or Waze, you know, Google Maps might tell me to get to Lower East Side from here to take a certain route, but it might not take into consideration the um, some construction or some issues in the roads that are closed. So what's, what it's telling me might not be actually the best uh, way, and only by taking a uh, referential user and trying to go through that which Waze collects is various uh, ref referential users, can you then form a picture of what is um, the reality? So, I mean, the question was, do you need a lot of referential users? And does every user have to be referential? Or can you pick a few and try and, and paint the picture? So, um, I think that referential users are, it is helpful to have because you can control for all other variables. When you're depending on uh, user information coming from users, there's not that control in place. Uh, so I do think that that's the way to go. And I think the answer is as much as possible. You know, you can have uh, robotic automated referential users going 24 seven, which you can't do manually. You can have them uh, spread out geographically in different areas. It's wherever you have an operational risk that you want to put that referential user to ensure that what's most important to you uh, for your revenue or for your viewers experience is being tested constantly. Yes. What is sort of the like atomic unit of, of QOE fuel, right? So if I'm, the stuff that I'm delivering is within an enterprise and I'm trying to hit all these different offices across the country, and most of the people that if they have problems probably don't even know how to tell me that, that, that my stream is buffering or whatever. Like, what can I look for, you know, software aside or product aside, just in terms of like, you know, what does it mean to assess QOE such that I can actively do that, right? And, like, say something to that. Right, yeah, so a big part of doing this is that your operational team has their fingers on the pulse of this referential user to identify these signals before there's an issue. But um, oftentimes, if that's not done, you do have to wait for that customer feedback and those complaints to come in before you identify a trend and have to address it, right? So I think the point is to have the right people monitoring the right things so that you're addressing these issues uh, versus trying to um, Wait for wait for that feedback. Do these referential user agents run on standard uh, end user platforms unbeknownst to the user, or do you deploy this out in the network somewhere? Yeah, so it's it's actually um, the approach that we're encouraging, whether it's manually of picking up your uh, phone and you know hiring a consultant a company to uh, to test it manually, um, or whether it's automating it. It's actually from the end device, so it's not through users, it's not in the network, um, unless you're not concerned with the end device. If you're only concerned about IP delivery, then you could, you could do it in the network. But we're actually testing post-device and looking at the video that uh, a viewer would see on the post-device screen. So your referential user, you might want to uh, have an iPhone, uh, a Roku, a Fire TV, all, all the devices that are important to you um, monitored. So we, uh, so Whitby itself has robotic um, uh, users. It's basically a rackable unit or a desktop unit that's uh, that are these robots. We visualize them as robots, but basically they're computers, um, and they, so they're not software. Uh, they're hardware based. Yeah. Well, my time is up, everyone. Thank you so much for your questions. I'll be here if you'd like to continue the conversation, and I hope you have a great content delivery summit.